Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the virtual pancreas cancer awareness event. Uh, my name is Patrick Varley. I'm going to be the MC for the evening. I'll get, introduce myself briefly. I'm uh, an assistant professor at the School of Medicine and Public, he Public Health at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, I work in the Division of Surgical Oncology as a surgical oncologist uh, with a clinical interest in uh, cancers of the uh, GI system, including pancreas and uh, advanced colon cancers. Uh, I joined uh, the faculty uh, after completing my medical school at uh, NYU uh, in New York, uh, and then I spent the last uh, 10 years at the University of Pittsburgh for my uh, general surgery and surgical oncology training. Uh, it was my pleasure to join the faculty here and work with a number of great people, uh, and I'm happy to participate tonight and serve as your MC. Uh, I will now turn it over to uh, Charlie Quirt. Uh, he's one of the founding members of our Pancreas Cancer Task Force at the um, UW Cancer Center. And he's gonna go over information on what you can expect through the evening, as well as uh, how to participate uh, in the appropriate areas. Thanks, Charlie. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Dr. Varley, and a warm welcome to our virtual pancreas cancer awareness event for all of you out there in Zoom land. We're gonna walk through a few slides to make this awareness event an even richer experience for you. To enable those who are not able to be with us at this event, the session is being recorded. An email will be sent to all participants' email address with this recording's link. All attendees are in listen-only mode with no video. However, you have the ability to ask your questions at the end of the event and actually anytime during the event. Today's recording is very in volume, so you may want to adjust the volume on your phone or PC as needed. Next slide. For issues that arise for any of you, please feel free to use the chat feature. The chat is found by moving your cursor to the bottom of the screen and clicking on chat. Second note is there will be six recorded presentations. After the presentations are completed, we will have the final segment of the event, the question and answer segment. However, you can ask your questions at any time with using the QA icon. Questions can be asked using the QA icon found next to the chat icon. Again, today's recording is very in volume. You may want to adjust the volume on your phone or PC for each recording. The QA segment will have a panel of UW Carbon Cancer, Carbon Cancer Center faculty and staff who are with us here today and available to answer your questions. We thank you for joining us, for taking the time to get an update on what's happening at Carbon Cancer. Now enjoy the event. So it is now with uh, great pleasure that I'd like to introduce Governor Tommy G. Thompson. He previously served as the 42nd governor of Wisconsin and was the 19th United States Secretary of Health and Human Services. He's the longest serving governor in Wisconsin history and is the current interim president of the University of Wisconsin system. Governor Thompson is also a strong and dedicated advocate for pancreas cancer patients and shares his personal and professional stories about working to help find a cure. Please welcome Governor Tommy G. Thompson. Sources and the critical information that you're going to need about the treatment options as well as the care. And know this, ladies and gentlemen, you are not alone. Pancreas cancer presents so many challenges, and you already know that. The statistics of this disease are just plain grim. And what makes this disease even more challenging? No effective screening. Symptoms are vague, and a diagnosis typically only comes 
when the disease is advanced. And when the director of the UW Carbone Cancer Center, my friend and colleague, Dr. Howard Bailey, is asked what is it going to take to find a cure for cancer. His response is both simple and complex. It's going to take research to find that cure. And it is one of my life's passions to have just that. This fight is personal for me. I lost both my brothers and my farming partner to pancreatic cancer. It is an insidious, dastardly disease. I had two younger brothers. Both of them came down with pancreatic cancer. And both of them did not know it. And when the doctors finally found it, it was too late to operate. They suffered miserably. And I was so disgusted and, and absolutely felt hopeless that I was not able to do something. Here I had been Secretary of Health and had no ideas, no solutions to ease the pain and the suffering that my two younger brothers and my farming partner were going through. And before my brother Eddie, before he died, he grabbed my hand and he said, Tommy, you've got to do whatever you can to find a cure. It's not going to help me, but it might help other people. Since long before I became president of the UW system, I've always been deeply proud of this great school and especially the research that's done here. The University of Wisconsin has a renowned history of champion research in turning investigative results in basic science into clinical treatment that improves and extends the lives of those with cancer. Patients who come to the Carbone Center for Treatment for Pancreas Cancer are cared for by a team of nationally renowned surgical, medical, and radiation oncologists in a multidisciplinary patient-centered approach. The shared mission is always to extend the life and the quality of life of all pancreas cancer patients. And through innovative collaborative research, be able to finally find the cure. To this end, the Carbone Center is working with allies all across the university, across the state, across the country, and yes, around the world. And here's one example. The UW Carbone is partnering with the UW Collaborative Genomics Core and Precision Medicine Molecular Tumor Board. Well, that was a mouthful. P-M-M-T-V, to be able to provide a forum for expert clinicians, pathologists, and scientists, to be able to discuss and analyze tumor genotypes and molecular abnormalities in order to recommend patient-specific therapies. And let me point out something important. This service, ladies and gentlemen, is free to Wisconsin patients. Let me say that again. This service is free to Wisconsin patients. We've all got a lot to keep us up at night. Worrying about cancer and COVID is a very cruel one-two punch. But cancer doesn't pause for the pandemic. Our global priority now is to stop the spread of COVID-19. But at the same time, continuing to provide excellent care for cancer patients, continuing to invest in innovative research, and continuing to connect the survivor community with cancer resources. Let me give you a sense of how the UW Carbone is doing all of this. This center has recently been selected to take part in a national trial to determine the best ductile adenocarcinoma, PDAC, a highly prevalent type of pancreatic neoplasm that's led by principal investigator oncologist, Dr. Noel Locanti. 
The trial focuses on understanding how chemo affects older adults' functional abilities while at the same time going through this chemo treatment. Another three pancreatic research projects are also underway at UW Carbone Cancer Center, as well as a collaborative research project with the Medical College of Wisconsin. And nine more new applications have been submitted just this month for pancreas cancer pilot projects on campus. The point is, while medical professionals continue to be vigilant and provide extra safety precautions for our patients and their families during this pandemic, we're continuously working to find a new intervention and improve treatment options in order to expand immunotherapy and develop screening tests. Right now, the race is on to find a biomarker for pancreatic cancer, something that would show up in a blood test. While prevention efforts are a priority, researchers also want to continue to seek out and are for better care and treatment options. And that's where gene sequencing is potentially useful. This is where a tumor is analyzed to figure out what gene mutation is causing the cancer, which may help determine what types of chemotherapy or what types of drugs the tumor may be most responsive to. The hope is that the combination of earlier detection and more effective treatment could turn around the story for so many people who are facing this insidious disease. As my two brothers, Eddie and Artie, would say, that truly, ladies and gentlemen, is worth fighting for. And as Alex Trubeck has shown us, who just passed away with pancreatic cancer, staying in the fight is what it's all about. This fight to find a cure, to find a solution to pancreatic cancer. So thank you, each and every one of you, very much for joining this event. We hope you find it useful. Coming up, we've got several presentations, personal stories, and a panel of experts to be able to take your questions and give you answers. My best wishes to each of you. And thanks for joining us. Thanks for continuing this fight against this insidious disease of pancreatic cancer. Good luck, and let's do it together. Let's find the cure. I'd like to thank Governor Thompson for uh, being with us virtually this evening and providing a great introduction uh, and sharing his passion for uh, finding ways to combat uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, I'd like to next introduce uh, Dr. Zachary Morris, who's an assistant professor and vice chair of the Department of Human Oncology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He obtained his MD and PhD from Harvard Medical School. He specializes clinically in the treatment of patients with melanoma and sarcomas. He's the co-primary -inve investigator on a cancer moonshot initiative funded as part of the Immune Oncology Translational Network. And his research focuses on the interaction between targeted radionuclide therapies and immunotherapeutics. His talk this evening is entitled Stimulating and Sustaining Immune Response Against Pancreatic Cancers Using Radiation Therapy. And as a reminder, uh, Dr. Morris will be with us at the end uh, of the presentations to answer your questions, which you can place uh, using the Q&A function uh, at any time. Hello, uh, my name is Zach Morris. I'm a assistant professor here at the University of Wisconsin and I work in the uh, radiation oncology department. I also have a research lab uh, focusing on interactions of radiation and immunotherapy. It's an honor to be here tonight uh, with you all. Uh, and I wanna thank the organizers for the invitation. I also wanna thank each of the audience members for the, their presence here tonight and for their support of uh, both the Carbone Cancer Center as well as pancreatic cancer. 
uh, and the research that we're doing in that area. With the time we have here tonight, I'd like to take the opportunity to discuss some research options and opportunities that we are looking to pursue here at the University of Wisconsin, uh, the pancreatic cancer and the development of new treatment approaches for that disease. As many of you may be aware, the development of a cancer takes uh, is a complex process and it takes many steps. But one of those critical steps is that any tumor in order to arise and present clinically has to develop mechanisms whereby it can avoid immune detection. And that's because our own immune systems are really designed and in many ways capable of killing tumor cells based on recognition of uh, the proteins that are derived from cancer mutations. As cancers arrive, they accumulate mutations and each of those makes a cancer cell somewhat different from the rest of our bodies and therefore recognizable to our immune systems. And the process whereby uh, our uh, cancer and uh, our own immune systems interact has been well described as a subject of uh, ongoing research. A model put forth here by Robert Schreiber's group at Washington University in St. Louis describes the so-called three E's of the tumor uh, immune system interactions. In this model, an early tumor may be recognized by uh, our immune systems and eliminated. But some tumors may evade this process, develop uh, certain characteristics that allow them to hold the immune system at bay and enter a state of equilibrium. And ultimately, those tumors that we see clinically that present in patients and are progressing or even spreading to distant sites are those that have escaped the immune system. And there's a variety of mechanisms that are now understood to enable tumors to do this. And the field of immunotherapy is one that has really taken off in recent years in cancer treatment uh, and in oncology, because this is a field that uh, essentially aims to reverse that process, uh, to take a tumor that has escaped immune detection and make it recognizable to immune cell killing. There's a number of different types of immunotherapies. I've listed uh, some of the categories of those here. And uh, for today's purposes, we'll focus largely on one of those categories, the immune checkpoint blockade or T-cell checkpoint inhibitors. Examples of these include antibodies that target anti-PD-1 or antibodies that target anti-CTLA-4. And the way that these work is that uh, a tumor cell shown in red here on the diagram can often be recognized by a patient's own immune system, particularly T cells shown in blue on this diagram on the top. And that recognition takes place when a T cell recognizes some feature of a cancer, typically a mutation that has led to the creation of an abnormal protein. And our immune cells, T cells in particular, can recognize that abnormal protein. And when they do, they have the capability of killing that tumor cell. However, to evade this, tumor cells can upregulate or increase the expression of certain proteins on their surface, such as PDL1, shown in purple here. And when that takes place, PDL1 can bind to the PD1 receptor on the T cell and effectively shut off that T cell or prevent the T cell mediated killing of the tumor cell. And these immunotherapies, such as anti PD1 antibodies, can block that, effectively taking off the breaks of that immune system and allowing it to go forward and kill that cancer. These types of immunotherapies have proven effective for a number of different types of cancer. Shown here from a study in patients with melanoma are, is a survival uh, plot. And what we see is that some patients who receive the drug nivolumab, which is an anti-PD-1 inhibitor uh, on the yellow curve, exhibit, exhibit long-term survival despite having metastatic disease. That is in contrast to what we typically used to see in that disease with chemotherapies as shown on the blue curve. That was a favorable uh, trial demonstrating progress with this immunotherapy in curing more patients with, despite having metastatic disease. In the early part of this curve do not seem to respond to immunotherapy. And as I've indicated in the color bar here, those patients that do not respond 
have been described as those that have tumors which are immunologically cold or have not yet really been recognized by their tumor. Whereas some patients will have immunologically warm, warm tumors that can be partially recognized, although they may not be cured, or even immunologically hot tumors that are capable of uh, having their tumors recognized and completely eradicated or killed by their own immune system. Unfortunately, from patients with pancreatic cancer, when these approaches have been tried, as seen here on the right-hand side, treatment with the same drug has not been as effective. And this is because these patients with pancreatic cancer, their tumors behave as if they're almost all immunologically cold. We see relatively little response in these tumors to immunotherapy alone. The reasons for that are, are multifactorial. There's many reasons why uh, pancreatic cancer may not respond as well to immunotherapies, and they include features of the tumor itself, the tumor genome and the mutations that are present. Potentially the, the relatively few number of overall mutations in pancreatic, in some patients with pancreatic cancer may lead to few opportunities for immune recognition. On the other hand, it may also be a, a product of patient's own immune system. And very importantly in the setting of pancreatic cancer, on the bottom here is the fact that the tumor microenvironment in pancreatic cancer can be immunosuppressive. There can be features in that microenvironment that take an active immune response and shut it down. What's really promising and where our lab is focused is on the potential role of radiation in taking those cold, immunologically cold tumors and converting them into immunologically hot tumors that will respond to these immune checkpoint inhibitors. The mechanisms whereby that can occur are diverse and uh, some of them are shown here. On a time scale with radiation, we see an immediate inflammatory release of cytokines we also see immediate killing of some of the suppressive immune cells in that tumor microenvironment. This can then lead to delayed, increased infiltration of the tumor by uh, more effective immune cells. And it also, as we know, radiation uh, can do, can kill tumor cells. And this has been termed uh, immunogenic cell death. Those dead tumor cells can provide material for the immune system to better recognize. And finally, the radiation that does not kill tumor cells still damages them in a way which can leave them more susceptible to anti-tumor immune responses. And so collectively, these effects can render an immunologically cold tumor immunologically hot. And as I'll show, they can potentially make it a tumor that would not respond to the immune checkpoint inhibitors responsive to those treatments. This effect has been termed the in situ vaccine effect of radiation. Prior to radiation, as shown in the diagram here, there can be relatively few markers of Im immune susceptibility on the tumor cells. And the tumor infiltrate, the immune cells, can be dominated by suppressive immune lineages in green. After radiation, on the right-hand side, we see increased levels of inflammatory cytokines and markers of immune susceptibility on the tumor cells and we see more tumor infiltration with effector T cells capable of killing these tumor cells. We've not given a vaccine per se to the, these tumors uh, in that we're not telling the immune system what to recognize. Rather, we term this an in situ vaccine effect in that radiation is turning the tumor in that patient's body into a site for enhanced immune recognition of the tumor itself and converting the tumor itself basically into a personalized form of vaccination for that patient. Now, if radiation has done this, and we've been using radiation, as you may or may not know, for more than 100 years to treat cancers, then why are we talking about this just now? We don't we see this all the time. Well, radiation alone can achieve this effect locally, but very rarely is that adequate to stimulate a response throughout a patient's entire body. So when we treat with radiation, we typically uh, treat a, a given site as shown here with the yellow arrow, and we expect a response at that arrow. However, in rare circumstances, it has been reported that some patients will have distant or responses outside of the radiated area, and that is thought to be immune mediated. It's simply quite rare. And why is that so rare? Well, there may be a number of reasons. Some of them may reflect 
the way that we've traditionally given radiation in the clinic. Lymphocytes are the immune cells that we want to kill, that we want to have kill the tumor cells uh, that we want to keep around, are very sensitive to radiation. And when we have traditionally given radiation, we've often had to do so with relatively large fields that incorporate or include blood vessels where there's a lot of lymphocytes flowing through. And we've also, also in order to limit toxicities, had to give radiation in small amounts divided over many weeks. And the effect of that is uh, on the plot here with the white circles, after radiation, because of the exposure of that blood pool to low doses of radiation, those very sensitive immune cells can be depleted. We see decreased blood cell counts in some patients after that performer radiation. As we've gotten better now at targeting radiation, we're able to give it in fewer number of treatments. And that limits the exposure uh, to the blood pool because it decreases the amount of time that we're treating these patients for. And with that, as shown in the gray circles here, we don't see these same effects of radiation on depleting lymphocytes. And so some of our technological advances may enable us to avoid some of those detrimental effects that limited the immune capacity of radiation in the past. Similarly, some of the techniques that we used in the past to deliver radiation, uh, most typically, uh, were not as targeted as what we're able to do now. Shown in green is a more uh, traditional approach of delivering radiation using 3D conformal techniques. With more advanced intensity modulated techniques in the black curve, we see reduced effects on lymphocyte counts. And with more advanced technologies such as particle therapies, either in the red or blue curves, we see even fewer effects. Here at the University of Wisconsin, we have tremendous technological capacities and can deliver state-of-the-art care. We don't, however, currently have particle therapy. This is an area that I feel uh, quite strongly we can do better with here at the University of Wisconsin. And we're currently fundraising in an effort to bring particle th therapy to the state of Wisconsin. Currently, there's no particle beam therapy anywhere in the state of Wisconsin. These are proton or carbon ion type of machines that are very large and relatively expensive investments, but they offer the opportunity to deliver more targeted treatments with greater precision. They're the standard of care for many types of pediatric cancers. And I strongly believe that these should be available to our patients here in Wisconsin. And if any of you are interested in contributing to these types of uh, fundraising efforts, we certainly welcome your contribution as we look to bring this technology here to the state of Wisconsin. These also, I think, will be instrumental in allowing us to maximize the potential for integrating radiation and immunotherapy, as I'm talking here in this discussion. Aside from those uh, advances technologically, we've also learned more about what radiation does in a given cell. With radiation, we've always known that radiation created DNA damage. DNA is typically housed in the nucleus of a cell shown here. But what we've more recently discovered is that after radiation damages DNA, sometimes that DNA can leak into the cytoplasm or the outer portion of the cell. And when that happens, cells behave as if they've been virally infected because in general, a cell should not have DNA in that outer portion. And when it does, it suspects or thinks, so to speak, that that is a virus that has infected that cell. And it activates pathways that upregulate the susceptibility of that cell to immune detection and killing. This doesn't happen at some of the doses that we have historically relied on for cancer treatment. In fact, at lower, lower more traditional doses, we see relatively little activation of this mechanism. Similarly, at very high doses, we see activation of inhibitory mechanisms that undo this effect. And it's in these moderate dose ranges that we're now delivering more frequently clinically because of our ability to better target radiation. And so both the technological advances and our knowledge base have advanced in recent years in a way that allow us to better understand how to integrate radiation effectively with immunotherapies. And interestingly, now when we've done that in clinical trials, we've seen as a field that patients, such as two patients represented here from a study in the lung cancer, may at baseline, not recognize certain features of their cancer. And then following radiation therapy, we can detect T cells 
that recognize mutations that are specific to that patient's cancer. And this is a proof of concept that radiation can in fact activate a tumor specific immune response or an in situ vaccine effect. And these were associated with very strong immune responses against cancer in these specific patients. And in preclinical settings, this can be demonstrated even further where we see when we give an immune checkpoint inhibitor like the PD-1 inhibitor or anti-CTLA-4 in a pancreatic cancer that's immunologically cold, on the blue and green curves, we see very little effect of those because these are immunologically cold tumors. But when we combine these types of treatments with radiation, giving radiation with a PD-1 inhibitor, a CTLA-4 inhibitor, or all three of them together, we can see dramatic improvements in survival in these preclinical settings. So this is very exciting. And this excitement is not something limited here to UW. There are more than 400 clinical trials currently open across the uh, world combining radiation with immune checkpoint inhibitors, including studies in pancreatic cancer. What our group is doing is looking ahead and assuming that while these effects, while these approaches may be effective, they probably won't cure all, all of these cancer patients and there'll be more to be done. And we're looking at developing new approaches to better stimulate an in situ vaccine effect and to better sustain that and propagate it against uh, tumor sites throughout a patient's body. I'd like to highlight for you one approach that we're taking that we're very excited about. And this is combining radiation with local delivery of immunotherapies. In this case, we're given a tumor specific antibody in red that is also fused to a cytokine, IL 2, in yellow. And the reason for doing this is when we deliver this, the antibody will target to and bind specifically to the tumor cell, and the cytokine can activate immune cells. So it bridges and activates immune cells next to the tumor cell. And doing this together with radiation, we hypothesized would give a more in situ vaccine, a more effective in situ vaccine effect. And that's exactly what we observed. Shown here in a pancreatic tumor model, we observed that while radiation or the injection of this immunocytokine the antibody IL-2 conjugate had relatively modest effects. The combination of these could cure pancreatic tumors in these mice. And what's even more important is when we did the same type of approach in a different tumor model, and we not only gave these mice a single tumor that we could eradicate, but we also injected them in their bloodstream with more than 350,000 tumor cells representing widespread metastatic disease in this setting we would radiate only one site, and we wanted to test whether the in situ vaccine that we, that we uh, developed in that site with radiation and our injection of the immunocytokine could eradicate those distant sites of uh, disease that were injected in the blood. And that's exactly what we found. We, we prolonged the survival with this combination approach. And you see here lungs from these mice. These tumors are black when they grow. And in the typical combination that I talked about, leading into this with radiation and the checkpoint inhibitor alone, we still see, unfortunately, tumors developing in these lungs. But with our enhanced in situ vaccine approach, we see considerable reduction, and in some cases, maybe even elimination of that metastatic disease. So as we look ahead now, uh, we are advancing these approaches with support from our UW Centene Award here with a focus on improving treatment methods for pancreatic cancer. In the coming years, with the award that we've recently received from the Centene Group, we will be testing these approaches using antibodies and IL-2. And we specifically want a test approach where we don't directly inject these into tumor, but rather harvest blood, as we might from a patient, isolate their immune cells, and use these agents to stimulate those immune cells outside of the body in a Petri dish where we can better control things, and then reinfuse that patient's own immune cells back into them. We believe this will have better safety, better convenience by eliminating the need for tumor injections, and it will be more readily uh, something that we can bring to clinical trial because of uh, regulatory advantages. We're also hopeful that within the next one, two years, we can de develop a proof of concept clinical trial here, and I'm working together with Dr. Michael Bassetti, Dr. Jack here at the University of Wisconsin to do just that. This is an area that the Centene money 
uh, an award will help with, but we uh, will certainly need additional funding support in order to get this clinical trial off the ground. And so with that, I wanna thank you all for being here. I wanna summarize what I think is the take home of the talk today, which is that we believe combining radiation and immunotherapies may overcome some of the barriers that have historically limited our ability to cure metastatic cancers, including pancreatic cancer. We believe it will that these combinations will do so because they'll have relatively limited toxicity due to their exquisite specificity to the patient's own tumor. Because of their specific patient mutations and then kill those tumor cells and learn more as they go, as, as the immune system kills, it processes the, that material from the dead tumor cell and recognizes additional features so that when a patient becomes resistant to a drug, for instance, it's because some of those tumor cells don't have the target of that drug. In this case, we expect that not to be an, effect, uh, an effective means of resistance because when we begin an immune response, it will begin to propagate itself and the immune system will learn as it kills and better recognize that patient's cancer so it can limit the chance for resistance. In addition, sanctuary sites have traditionally been a challenge. There's some areas like the brain or other parts of the body where chemotherapies can't get or other treatments sometimes are not possible. Radiation can be delivered to any location in the body and the immune system can survey every location in the body, including sites that we don't even see with imaging, those occult sites that may not, not be detected now but could show up in the future. So that these approaches offer a very promising chance to improve upon the treatments of pancreatic cancer. But thank you for being here tonight. Uh, really welcome any questions that you may have during the discussion portion of this. I wanna thank uh, our many collaborators and funding uh, support here, uh, in particular the Centene Group for their award uh, related to pancreatic cancer here at the Carbone Cancer Center. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Morris for that uh, great uh, discussion of uh, some very exciting uh, new uh, technology and uh, efforts to treat pancreatic cancer. I think uh, his presentation and his work is a great representation of things going on here at the Cancer Center to uh, provide new options and new hope for patients uh, with pancreatic cancer. I, I think I'd editorialize as well and um, use this opportunity to thank uh, all those patients who, who uh, participate in trials through either the cancer center here or elsewhere, uh, who have you know really been the ones who uh, make some of these discoveries possible uh, for uh, you know to help people in the future, uh, even if they don't get direct benefit. You know, everyone that participates in trials to find out these new uh, new pieces of information uh, does a, a great service for for people. With pancreatic cancer uh, in the future. Uh, so next, I'd like to introduce uh, Jean Cherchel. Uh, she's speaking here again. Pancreatic cancer last year and is being treated at the UW uh, Veterans Affairs Hospital. Jean writes that she is truly honored to participate in today's event because moving the big needle on pancreatic cancer begins with awareness. Good afternoon, my name is Jean Churchell and my hero and my husband Al has approved this message and I'm very honored to be participating in today's pancreatic cancer awareness event because that's where it begins with awareness. I'm going to spend the next few minutes sharing Al's story which in most cases really becomes an our story. Al was diagnosed two and a half years ago out of left field shockwave number one after a uh, two weeks after a per perfectly good annual checkup. And yet, even a few weeks later, shockwave number two came when we learned that it be had become inoperable before chemo had even started. Al has had really terrific care. He's a veteran and he has been being treated at the VA hospital right next door to UW Carbone. And under the guidance of Carbone Oncology and GI teams, we are exceedingly grateful for the combined expertise, skills, and compassion of 
VA and UW. It's unique and it's not lost on, on us how valuable it has it is. Creating time to keep, add, and even eliminate treatment options while maintaining quality of life has really been the name of our game. Um, you know, all, th all the things that we're doing is aimed and supporting that effort. After all, it was just one Petri dish out of 10,000 that led to the discovery of penicillin. Why, ca why can't we find another Petri dish? And looking back at our journey, four themes started to merge. The first of which is attitudes and beliefs. Number one is um, I focused on finding pancreatic cancer success stories. And the, the disease stats um, are easy to find, but serve no real value ultimately when you're seeking on how to live with cancer. So for me, anyway, the ability to connect with patients and caregivers that were on or ahead of this same journey that we're on, and to be able to learn from them and to continue the connection was invaluable, particularly while the earth is just shaking under your feet. This is a worldwide yet very tight-knit community, and I am so grateful for the people that I've been able to stay connected with. It's, it is a force. Al has really been wise to leave the researching and all of that to me. He focuses on day-to-day -day living a normal life and stays very well connected with family and friends who truly are our lifeline. We lean in and we lean in heavily. As one dear friend said to me, it's not a bother, it's an honor. Optimizing health during sickness um, sounds kind of odd in some ways, but optimizing health physically and mentally is more important than ever and it is 10 times harder with cancer. So we didn't wait to get started, even though Al was healthy walking in, and even today people can't believe that he has cancer when they look at him. We call it, we do everything we can to help Al stay in the ring. Diet and nutrition um, is really a cornerstone for us. We view food and have long viewed food as medicine. We pushed for a nutritional consult early on and didn't wait for that. And today we still get a nutritional consult every four months with integrative insight to guide our diet uh, and the decisions that we make therapeutically, adjust them and continue to tweak them. Things change and your diet has to adjust as well. Our goal is to keep weight up, inflammation down and the immune system up and there are ways to do that that we've learned. Exercise is a Herculean effort. Um, it's a Herculean effort some days and even more so than other. But one way or another, Al finds a way to move, to strengthen his muscles. He's got house projects. We've got plenty of those. Walks, yoga, the elliptical, a punching bag, acupuncture, and an electrocyzed recumbent bicycle are all the tools in the bag. And he uses them often. Emotional health takes on a whole nother dimension in pancreatic cancer because who knew that this little organ called the pancreas wields so much power, but it has, um, but it does. And um, there are plenty of side effects to manage and to document, and they're actually relatively easy to document and quantify, but emotional health, not so much. So we know and now expect that with pancreatic cancer, these waves of depression are gonna roll in. And I know that when, when those days hit, that it's the disease talking, not Al when he's frustrated. Al also knows that he has uh, all those tools of, and exercise and others to put into motion to help cope with the depression that can, that can hit. And he does a really great job of it. He is a master of it. For me, as the caregiver, spouse, advocate, scheduler, coordinator, all these roles, um, it's my friends, my meditation, getting outside, exercise, yoga, golf, um, and what rankers me truly is uh, gratitude. Gratitude's my go-to place on the hardest of days. 
We advocate for ourselves and we partner with our care team. You, we really need to take an, an approach that says anything that we can do to help our care team help us is the goal. It's a two-way street. We try to be students as well as advocates. I use tr apps to track side effects to help in communication with our team. I rely heavily on the electronic health record and, and the portals. It's made my job as a caregiver and advocate so much easier, so much more reliable and accurate. I have a simple electronic filing system of key medical record documents that I print when we travel in case of emergency. And we make a plan for every appointment. We come armed with questions. We have a wonderful dialogue with our oncologist. We look at the pros and cons, and we look ahead to so we have a better understanding of what to expect. Having a plan always brings so much more peace of mind and instills confidence that you can go forward successfully. The fourth theme is really one of the most vital that I would leave you with, and, and that's around the genetic and molecular profiling. It really became a game changer for, for Al, uh, and more importantly, and equally importantly actually, is for his family. The genetic testing um, really became a thread of awareness, prevention, and treatment for Al. Our advice is don't wait on the testing, get it done sooner, and here's why, because here's Al's story. Tissue testing was attempted at about month 13, but there was insufficient samples, so then the germline or genetic testing using a blood sample was performed. And indeed, Al tested positive for the BRCA2 mutation. Who knew we'd be so grateful to find a mutant gene? Because this one gene is found in breast, ovarian, prostate, and pancreas cancers. During a family history data collection exercise, a first cousin shared with me that she tested positive for BRCA2 as well, two years earlier at UW. It, it really became a part of her breast cancer treatment plan as well. It explained in part, maybe in large part, the positive response that Al had to the initial chemo in 2018, and because it had just become an ASCO standard a month before he started chemo. BRCA2 was a, also a criterion that led to uh, being able to take advantage of a newly approved PARP inhibitor therapy in 2019 that gave him such a break from infusions. Further, the family testing that we did revealed BRCA2 in one daughter and one granddaughter. Our eldest grandson elected to defer, te defer the testing, but the point is he's aware. Consequently, Al's daughter was referred to UW Women's Oncology in the newly formed pancreas clinic. She elected to proceed with a preventive procedure and is following the new UW pancreas cancer screening protocol with early detection methods including regularly scheduled GI procedure and targeted MRIs. Our granddaughter and she both will go on a more aggressive breast cancer screening protocol. This is awareness, awareness in caps. I see it as a gift that Al gave his entire family. Three generations are aware. An entire family has been appraised. They have a better shot at prevention and early detection. Finally, I would say thank your team and thank them often. We can't say it enough, and they can't hear it enough. I really wish there was time to shout out to every single member, beginning with Al's UW ring leaders, Dr. Marina Sharifi and Sam Lubner. Our integrative oncology team gets a big shout out too. In conclusion, I'll leave you with a thought that has become a mantra. Replace worry with prayer in all of its forms. Replace fear with hope, and we find peace and gratitude. Every day is a gift. Thank you for listening. Uh, thanks to Jean and Al for sharing their story. I think uh, Jean's comments uh, highlight something that all of us who treat pancreatic cancer know and for all those people who have uh, are either fighting it or have family members that are dealing with it, that pancreatic cancer doesn't just affect the person with the disease, that it's really uh, something that's a, a family, uh, sort of something that's shared in, in a family and in, in our support uh, system is, is very important for making sure patients get the care that they need and 
tolerate it uh, to the best of their ability. So I think she's a great example of that uh, and something uh, we would hold as, a, as an example for everyone else uh, facing this disease. Uh, so I now have the uh, privilege of introducing uh, survivor Susan Henneman. Uh, Susan was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer uh, about four years ago. She's been on chemo and then had radiation therapy to both the liver and a pancreas lesion. Uh, she has an amazing story to tell and gives us a good reason for hope. Hello, my name is Susan Heneman. Thank you for inviting me into your evening. And I, it's an honor to speak with you tonight. In October of 2016, about four years ago, I learned that I had stage four pancreas cancer. I'd like to talk to you tonight about my experiences, how that went, and I learned at that time that there were tumors in my pancreas, my liver, and my lungs. And today, the long story short is I feel great. I feel like I've beaten this thing back and I feel better than I have in years. So let's talk about each phase of my treatment. The first phase of my treatment began with chemotherapy with a mixture of drugs called fulfurinox, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. This went on for a few sessions and then I got very, very sick. The side effects or maybe other cancer had made me so sick they put me in the hospital for about 11 days. And at that time they really didn't think I was going to survive and I fooled them all. Happy to say that I fooled them all and I did survive. And in January of 2017, I went back on chemo with a little reduced dosage, a little fiddling with the cocktail as they call it. And I did really well. And so for every other Wednesday, followed by two days at home on the chemo pump, and then back 11 days later for more chemo. And it was fine. I had fairly mild side effects, a few bothersome ones, but nothing very life-threatening. I was in chemo on a regular basis for 28 months, all the way from January of 2017 through January of 2019. And nobody seemed to think that I would continue to tolerate that, but I did, I'm happy to say. Then in March of, <clears throat> excuse me, in March of 2019, I, w I had a short course of radiation, just a few weeks. And after that, they said that radiation had really <clears throat> done the job and cleared up the rest of my problems. And so since, since spring of 2019, I've been feeling great and no sign of anything to worry about at this point. You never know, but one day at a time, right? So as I said before, people were very, very supportive in all of my journey, my, my clinicians, of course, but also my family, my friends, all of the people who were taking care of me were taking really good care of me, but I had this feeling that I wasn't taking care of anyone. And I had a career in which, and, and a long time retirement career as a volunteer, in my career, there was a lot of me taking care of other people. So I missed that when I was ill. And so I thought, how can I get that sense of usefulness back? Fortunately, a friend called and said, would you talk to my friend, another girl, who, another woman actually, who had a pancreas cancer diagnosis just like mine? And I said, well, yes, of course I'd talk with her. And I started by doing that and the word spread and people were contacting me 
to do that more and more. Now, first of all, I don't claim to be any great counselor or anything, but I really think it helped people to understand on a different level what it's like to have this and what happens to you and what bothers you and what is okay about it. I think it also helps to find somebody who is doing well and use that example as something that may help you do well. So those are the lessons that I learned. It, it not only helped others, it helped me feel useful again. The other lesson I learned from having this experience, I hate the word journey, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, fern, I found that it really was uh, important to stay optimistic, hopeful, positive. I, I know that's really hard to do when you're feeling down or you're feeling worried. I really think it helped me to remember that I can't control the outcome. I can't control what's going to happen, but I can control how I react to it. And if I lecture myself a little bit, I can come up with some good things, things to be grateful for, things that are going well. And I, I don't know if that's just my own personality. People have called me positive by nature and optimistic by nature, but maybe I was raised that way, I don't know. Whatever it is, it beats the heck out of being negative. And being negative doesn't help you in any way. So I just sort of turned on the positive switch and made that my daily practice. So the other thing is, I really think it's important to be, don't, <clears throat> I think you're in the, the wrong place if you get ahead of yourself and you think about, oh, what'll happen next Christmas? Or what will this happen? Will I last this long? All of those horrible sort of uh, worries. I think it's really important to stay in the moment. I know that's a cliche, but if you can do one day at a time, that really helps you feel more positive. Okay, so finally, I just have two more quick requests for all of you who are watching and listening, and they are the following. First of all, it's okay to talk about pancreas cancer. Don't keep it in the shadows. Bring it out, talk to people, spread the word. When I was about seven, my father actually got cancer, but back in the 50s, you didn't say that word out loud. There was a superstition at the time that cancer spoken out loud was a bad thing. Of course, now we can talk about cancer, but I'm glad that's changed because it's no longer hidden in the shadows. So spread the word, that's my first request of you. The other thing I want to ask you to do is spread the word to all the people you know and everyone you talk to that it is not a death sentence, it is beatable. I would think you should be very clear with people that we can beat this disease. Now, lots of people have called me an outlier unusual. Uh, that's okay. They can call me that, but I prefer to call myself living proof. Pancreas cancer is beatable. So please spread the word. Thank you for listening. Good night. So thank you to Sue for sharing her story. I think it's a great reminder to us all that um, Everyone's journey is unique, uh, and we sort of don't know where that's going to begin and end when they enter this. Uh, all we can really control is how we uh, face the disease, both as providers and, and patients. So I think her story is a great example of that uh, and, and a good reminder to us all. Uh, so next, I'd like to introduce Ron Niendorf, who's been the chair of the Pancreas Cancer Task Force since its beginning in the spring of 2011. Ron lost his son-in-law, Brian Pichelle, that year uh, after a five and a half year battle with the disease. 
Ron formed the task force with others who had been affected, uh, whom he had met since Brian's diagnosis in 2006. He and the rest of the task force are committed to support the Gabon Cancer Center as it becomes one of the premier pancreas cancer research facilities in the world. Good evening. Thank you for joining us at our annual Pancreas Cancer Information Night. Because of the current COVID-19 pandemic, I'm speaking to you virtually tonight, and that's something new, like so many other things today. I can tell you that recording this in advance is a lot harder for me than standing in front of you, but here we go. I want to tell you a bit about the UW Carbone Pancreas Cancer Task Force that has organized this event. We're a group of volunteers dedicated to doing what we can to help Carbone become a world leader in pancreas cancer research and treatment. Our group formed almost 10 years ago in the spring of 2011 when several people who had been affected by pancreas cancer met with a group of doctors from Carbone Cancer Center. Some of us had already lost someone to pancreas cancer, others of us were about to. I will tell you though that over the years, two of our members have beaten the odds and are pancreas cancer survivors. In 2011, there was really no pancreas cancer specific research being done at Carbone. There were 280 researchers and doctors, but none of them were working specifically on pancreas. To be sure, there was pancreas cancer related research going on, but nothing specific to pancreas cancer. We knew we had some of the best cancer researchers in the world at the Carbone Cancer Center, and we wanted to find a way to get them to think about how what they were doing might relate to pancreas. And so we asked the doctors in our group what we could do to encourage pancreas cancer research at Carbone. And what they told us was that basic research was needed Research is kind of a catch-22 situation. You need really good, strong data to win the large national grants that can sustain a pancreas cancer research program. But you need money to get that data. And that's where we found an opportunity. We They assured us that Many people at Carbone had a keen interest in pancreas cancer and that if the funding were available, they would make proposals. And so our group decided to form our task force and to raise money for basic research and to find ways to help patients that are currently being treated. We established the Pancreas Cancer Research Fund and started working on our first fundraiser. We encouraged others to do the same. We met regularly with Carbone staff to ask how we might increase the visibility of what we were doing within Carbone. We organized presentations to local service groups by Carbone researchers. And we started looking for other ways that we could support the fight against this disease. I think that overall we have been quite successful. Uh, last year, the Pancreas Cancer Research Fund passed the $1 million mark. To date, that money has funded 25 pancreas cancer-specific research projects. Next month, we'll select two more that will start in 2021. We've organized many presentations to the public, including these information nights, and our annual fundraising uh, role in our annual fundraising event is, uh, roll, roll and Stroll for Pancreas Cancer uh, will be held next year uh, on August 8th. We'll start planning for that in, in January. While the task force has provided the, provided the initial impetus to get things started, we very quickly saw an internal uh, momentum begin to build within Carbone as the, the thanks to really the, the management, the leadership, the doctors and the researchers. Um, 
as the vis visibility grew, we saw more and more. Uh, we saw new doc. We knew we saw a new. <laughs> sorry. As the visibility within Carbone grew of what was happening, we saw more researchers submitting grant proposals, and we saw new doctors and researchers with a specific interest in pancreas join the staff. We have seen an expansion in the effort to deal with pancreatic cancer. Uh, for example, uh, in February of this year, uh, the UW Health Carb and Carbone Cancer Center Pancreas Cancer Prevention Program was launched. The, that effort is committed to expanding research and improving outcomes and quality of life for pancreas cancer patients and survivors. To help patients, we have assembled what we call comfort totes. These are a Land's End tote with items specific to the needs of pancreas cancer patients that are in treatment. It includes things like fuzzy socks infused with aloe, lotion designed for cancer patients going through chemo and radiation, lip balm, ginger, and ginger tea, a, a cookbook written for the digestive needs of a pancreas cancer survivor, books of words, puzzles, and art coloring, and many other items. We give one of those to each new pancreas cancer patient. In another initiative, we're working currently with Carbone to develop a peer mentoring program where our members will be trained to provide support to patients and their families. We hope to be able to start that in early 2021, but the COVID-19 pandemic may have a little uh, to say about that. But I'll tell you more about that next year at our information night. Also in 2019, we published a five-year pancreas cancer strategic plan for UW Carbone Cancer Center. This plan is a roadmap for the next phase in building a permanent and sustainable cancer, pancreas cancer research program. Over the coming five years, Carbone will establish an environment that will make more information available both internally and, and externally. They will strengthen their team of, of experienced researchers and they'll provide opportunities for medical and graduate students and others uh, to go down the career path of pancreas cancer research. Carbone is expanding this world-class pancreas cancer research team so that through research, they can provide better methods for early diagnosis, for improved treatment options, and ultimately a cure for this terrible disease. I think that's about enough about the task force. So in closing, I'd like to express though, my sincere gratitude to the leadership, the doctors, the at Carbone for working with the task force to make all of this happen. I also want to thank all of the past and present members of the task force who have worked so hard and volunteered hundreds of hours to make this happen. If you'd like to learn more about the task force or take a look at the five-year strategic plan, go to uwhealth.com slash PCTF. That's uwhealth.com slash PCTF, like Pancreas Cancer Task Force. Again, thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks, Ron, uh, for that. Uh, again, I just echo uh, his thanks, uh, not only to him, but the rest of the task force for their vision uh, and efforts to support not only the research uh, that we as physicians and, and researchers do, but also uh, their continued support for patients and their families who have pancreas uh, cancer. So next, uh, we're going to go to uh, Emily Reinstead and Crystal Dowderman. Uh, Emily Reinstead is a family nurse practitioner who specializes in hepatobiliary surgical oncology and pancreas cancer prevention. 
Her experience as a nurse includes hospice, rehabilitation, medical, surgical, and home infusion. She has a special interest in prevention, underserved populations, research, and integrative health. And she spent a year in the AmeriCorps and participated in medical missions uh, to deliver care abroad to low access communities. Crystal Dowderman started at UW Hospital in May of 2007 as a student nurse. She's been with us since then and uh, worked in an inpatient unit F46 for about seven years where she cared for surgical patients, including those having pancreas surgeries. She then transitioned into a new role as a coordinator for the hepatobiliary surgical team in 2014. Uh, and she currently serves in the role as a nurse navigator uh, in the pancreas mass clinic. Uh, they'll be talking to us today about our new efforts uh, in our multidisciplinary cl clinics, uh, which they'll explain and have been the uh, effort of uh, Dr. Rebecca Minner, who joined uh, the de department as the chair uh, in 2018, who's not only a world-renowned uh, researcher, but also has a special interest in pancreatic cancer. And it's always good to have uh, someone uh, making the decisions that uh, has, a, has an interest in pancreas cancer because uh, she's really sort of moved the needle on the way that we do things for patients with pancreatic cancer. So I'll turn it over to Crystal and Emily. Good evening. Thank you for inviting us to be here this evening, even if only virtually. This event is such an incredible resource to our community, so thank you to everyone that worked so hard to put this together. We feel really grateful to be involved. We're excited to share with you some information about two programs we have here at UW Hospital regarding pancreas cancer prevention and treatment. My name is Emily Reinstead, and I am a nurse practitioner in the Surgical Oncology Department and also the Pancreas Cancer Prevention Clinic, and uh, Crystal Dowderman will also be presenting today and she will be talking mostly about the pancreas mass clinic and she's a nurse navigator for the multidisciplinary pancreas clinic. I'm going to take a few moments to talk to you about the location and function of the pancreas. On this drawing you can see a pinkish curvy organ in the upper right of the picture or your screen and this is the stomach. The pancreas is represented by the yellow more textured looking drawing and it sits just behind the stomach. The pancreas is a very important organ and any issues with it can cause major medical problems. The function of the pancreas is twofold. It has exocrine and endocrine function. Most people associate the pancreas with endocrine function because they think about insulin production and diabetes. The endocrine function truly is related to regulating blood sugar. So it produces hormones such as insulin and glucagon. And insulin actually prevents your blood sugar from getting too high and glucagon prevents your blood sugar from getting too low. There's also exocrine function of your pancreas and it produces digestive juices and enzymes that help to digest fats, carbs, and proteins, but fats is really important. And it helps us to then be able to absorb important vitamins like vitamins A, D, E, and K. Cancer can develop in both the exocrine and endocrine cell types. The endocrine cells can typically develop into pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but the most common cancers arise from the ductal cells, which is called pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And this is usually what most people think of when we say pancreas cancer. Many of you probably know of a lot of the risk factors for pancreas cancer. Smoking seems to be at the top of a risk factor for most diagnoses, diseases, illnesses, but it's at the top of our list for pancreas cancer as well. And then alcohol is right behind it. Diabetes does increase your risk. And regards to diet, this applies more to an unhealthy diet or a diet that is high in red meats or processed meats. So we know that you could decrease your risk for pancreas cancer by having a diet that's high in fruits and vegetables. As we get older, our risk for cancer increases. So uh, it is not surprising then that your pancreas cancer risk increases as we age. Um, race, so that is a applied 
mostly to increased risk if you are of African American or Ashkenazi Jewish descent. And obesity kind of links in with diet as well, but a sedentary lifestyle can increase your risk for pancreas cancer. There are a lot of other factors that are being researched that I think we'll learn more, a lot more about over the next few years. Um, but those are the, the big ones that we have significant research to support. So the two clinics that we have here at UW regarding pancreas cancer are Pancreas Cancer Prevention Clinic and the Pancreas Mass Clinic. The goal of the Pancreas Cancer Prevention Clinic is to provide better continuity of care and care access for patients with pancreas cysts or high-risk genetics. It is important that we are targeting patients with these risk factors as the overall risk factor for pancreas cancer in the general population is only about 1%, so broad screening is not feasible. Our goal is to find and control risk factors sooner and do research to identify detection methods to find pancreas cancer earlier, or better yet, the precursor lesion, and take action before it develops into cancer. We provide a multidisciplinary review of each patient's imaging and overall risk factors with experts in the field, including gastroenterology, surgical oncology, genetics, and radiology. Patients are partnered with a dedicated nurse navigator and a provider to develop a personalized long-term care plan and follow-up to ensure high-quality surveillance or screening over time with imaging as recommended by the ACG guidelines and our multidisciplinary group. The Pancreas Cancer Prevention Clinic broadly follows two groups of populations, patients that have pancreas cysts and patients and or patients that have a high, higher risk of pancreas cancer due to their personal or family history of cancer. And this is a slide I just wanted to talk to you more specifically about pancreas cysts. So, 70% of pancreas cysts are found incidentally, and most cause no symptoms, and are only found when scanning for something else. So it's like a colon polyp where most will never turn into cancer. <clears throat> there are a number of different types of cysts. We follow some more closely than others. An MRI or CT image gives us the benefit of evaluating many different cyst features to help us determine which cysts are more worrisome than others. We also have another great evaluation method, an EUS, which is an endoscopic ultrasound with fine needle aspiration. This is a procedure that allows our endoscopists to look more closely at the pancreas and sample cyst fluid. We use this cyst fluid to help us better characterize the cyst and using DNA analysis help to predict chance for malignancy over time of that cyst. As we discussed, the pancreas has great function in our body, so it is never our preference to have to take part of it out in order to resect a cyst. So we use the above tools carefully to ensure we only intervene if we have high suspicion for malignant potential or confirmed malignancy from the EUS. About 10% of pancreas cancer is believed to be related to genetics. Because of this, we follow patients closely that have a significant personal or family history of pancreas, colon, breast, or melanoma in their family with screening via EUS or MRI. There are certain germline mutations that can increase your risk. A germline mutation means it is present in every cell of your body. We know that there are multiple hits required to develop a pancreas cancer you can develop a pancreas cancer more readily. Pancreatic tumors are either exocrine or endocrine tumors, as we touched on earlier. This is based on the type of cell they start in. Knowing the type of tumor is important because each type acts differently and responds to different treatments. About 93% of pancreas cancers are in exocrine tumors, and the most common type is pancreas cancer adenocarcinoma. About 7% of pancreatic tumors are neuroendocrine tumors, also called islet cell tumors. They often grow slower than exocrine tumors. 
And this slide here shows the progression from a normal pancreatic ductal cells as they move toward becoming a cancer. And it also shows, if you can see on the bottom, the HER2, KRAS, P16, those show us mutations that can help us to identify where a cell change is at from a sample. PANIN3, which is right on the way on the right side, is the step just before an invasive cancer. So we ideally want to catch these changes before they get to that point. As you know, we have a lot of more work to do as a medical profession to get the five-year survival rate up. It is through research that we can do this. It is through the collection of liquid biospecimens that we have the opportunity to discover biomarkers for early cancer detection. We know that the only way to advance research is by partnering with our colleagues. We already partner with other sites around the country to combine our data, and we know this will give us the best chance at advancing our knowledge of pancreas cancer. One of the ways we are encouraging early detection here at UW is through an EPIC build program called an Anomaly Report. This program allows us to get a notification anytime someone has an abnormal finding on their pancreas. Our nurse navigators can then reach out to the patient's care team to get approval to contact them about this finding and follow them in our clinic. We know at this point we can't prevent all pancreas cancer, but we can ensure that we are evaluating every patient for pancreas cancer risk based on that abnormal imaging finding. The worst case scenario is that a worrisome imaging finding is overlooked. This report has allowed us to nearly eliminate that chance. This is a slide that just shows the demographics of the patients that we have followed uh, since opening in March. with either their pancreas cysts or for pancreas cancer screening. So as we are able to increase our volumes, we can start reaching out to those specialties to um, start following them so that we can get all of these patients to be followed in the same place. So we do anticipate that over time these volumes are actually going to continue to increase. We've had a number of significant findings already since opening in March. We recently had a patient we were reviewing their imaging of their pancreas cyst in our multidisciplinary conference and it was noted during conference that there was an enlarged worrisome lymph node. We initiated a workup of the, of the enlarged lymph node and patient unfortunately it was diagnosed with lymphoma. This likely would not have been caught without this conference. So we're incredibly grateful to have the participation of some amazing specialists in these conferences to help us take a more detailed approach at these images to help us catch things like this. Another example is a patient that had surgery to have a worrisome pancreas cyst removed and the pathology came back as high grade dysplasia which is considered carcinoma in situ, or the step right before invasive cancer. We hope for many more instances like this. Pancreas cancer, as many of you know from personal experience, is a devastating and too often fatal diagnosis. We will do everything we can to prevent others from having to experience, experience it. It's always our goal to catch early or prevent pancreas cancer, but we do get referrals for patients that have a worrisome pancreas mass or patients that already have pancreas cancer when they come to us. This is when our patients are taken care of in the pancreas mass clinic. So now we will switch gears. My name is Crystal and I'm the nurse navigator for the pancreas mass clinic, which started in November of 2019. We see all patients with a pancreas mass in a multidisciplinary approach. The following diagnoses are seen within that clinic. Any undiagnosed pancreas mass, all pancreas adenocarcinomas at any stage of diagnosis, pancreas neuroendocrine tumors, and solid pseudopapillary tumors.
What is multidisciplinary care? It's a team approach from a range of disciplines that work together to deliver comprehensive care to try to address as many of the patient's needs as possible. In the pancreas mass clinic, we currently have medical oncology, surgical oncology, and nutrition seeing the patients together on the same day. If needed, we also have social work and radiation oncology available to step in. We also discuss the patient prior to seeing them in clinic in our hepatobiliary multidisciplinary conference, which allows for a team discussion about best plan of care for the patient. The idea is to bring the patient in for a team approach to provide them with the most comprehensive cancer care. As the nurse navigator, I'm the front line for this clinic. I start with the intake process and review and gather all information needed prior to the first visit. I then reach out to patients to introduce myself and the multi-D clinic, review patient's history and their support system. I discuss with the patient about scheduling of appointments and may order other testing needed prior to the visit, which then I help coordinate for them. Also, as the navigator, I do a fair amount of teaching with the patient over the phone and in the clinic at the time of the visit related to their treatments and offering of other support services. The Pancreas Mass Clinic went live in November 2019, and as you can see on this map, we see patients from all around the area. We are working with external facilities to promote awareness of the clinic and to establish relationships with them so we can provide all patients with the same great care. And here's a graph showing our new patient volume since opening. So how can patients be referred or seen at the UW? We see patients who self-refer, who get referred from their primary cares or other providers they see, or if they would like a second opinion here at the UW. The clinic is located at the main UW hospital on the second floor. Thank you to everyone for listening in and being a part of this night. And remember to wear your purple proud. Uh, so thanks to uh, Emily and Crystal for that great overview um, of the efforts here to advance uh, care for pancreatic cancer patients. Uh, I'd certainly like to thank them personally. I work with them uh, as a member of these clinics. Uh, there's definitely the first line of care for uh, all of our patients uh, and, you know, honestly spend the most time uh, with patients and their family. So uh, I think we as physicians sometimes, uh, you know, get the credit, but the reality is uh, it's people like Emily and Crystal who are doing, you know, a lot of the work to make sure patients get what they need and understand what's, uh, what's happening. So thank you to them uh, for all that they do. Um, Next, uh, we're going to go uh, to our panel discussion. Uh, so uh, I think as some people have found, uh, you can use the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen to ask questions. We do have some questions already. Uh, I will uh, go through them uh, and have the panelists uh, answer. Uh, I will introduce the, the panelists. So we have uh, Dr. Zach Morris, who presented, as well as Emily Reinstead and, and Crystal Dauterman. Uh, in addition uh, to that, uh, that group, uh, we have joining us uh, Dr. Natalia Oboa. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine here at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine. Uh, she specializes in gastrointestinal uh, malignancies uh, and would be one of the people that uh, helps us decide uh, which chemotherapy and, and when to do that. Uh, we also have um, Jeremy, uh, Dr. Jeremy Kratz. Uh, he's a fellow in hematology, medical oncology, and palliative care here at UW. Uh, he's an active researcher uh, as well, uh, and uh, I believe will be staying on with us uh, after he finishes his training. Uh, so I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, for being here, and um, if it works for everyone, I can uh, start the questions. I think this was covered uh, a little bit in some of the, the presentations. Uh, there's been a few questions regarding uh, genetics 
uh, and so uh, so Nancy Copeland asked uh, about the genetic link between breast cancer and pancreas cancer. Um, and there is uh, another question from Jerome Klein asked about pancreatic cancer and genetic screening and research developments. Uh, so I um, would ask uh, maybe if uh, someone, maybe Dr. Raboa or um, uh, Dr. Kratz can talk a little bit about pancreas cancer genetics and sort of uh, when patients should be tested and uh, how we follow them if they have known genetic mutations. Hi, good evening, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for organizing such a great event and um, uh, the presentations were excellent and I see a lot of good questions coming. Um, the question of genetics is a very important question. Um, in the past, we used to only refer patients with significant family history um, or those who were diagnosed at very young age um, to genet for genetic screening. And we realized that we, we were missing a number of patients who actually have mutations that could be passed down to their uh, kids or the mutations that run in the families. And so about two years ago, American Society of Clinical Oncology made formal recommendations that every new patient uh, with, with new diagnosis of pancreas cancer should be referred for genetic testing. And so in our um, practice at UW, uh, this is an, an automatic referral. Everybody who is seen in a pancreas clinic um, is being referred for genetic testing. And, um, and the, our geneticists are really the best ones to comment on um, you know, the results and what implications those have for uh, for the patients, for the family member. And I tell my patients it's important to get tested not only because of the, um, because it's important to know what can be passed down to the family members, but also because we have drugs that are being developed specifically for the alterations and genetic mutations that can be found. In terms of the link between the breast cancer and pancreas cancer, the BRCA gene, which is the one we frequently pick up during the testing, you have heard about this earlier today, is associated with uh, risk for breast cancer as well. And so can run in the families where we see um, a lot of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, um, and also pancreas cancer. And then we have um, high-risk clinics as well that are run by our gastroenterology colleagues that where, where, where family members of those with pancreas cancer can be seen for further screenings. And this is Emily. Um, I'm the nurse practitioner from the prevention clinic, and I can speak a little bit to um, the prior. So for in our clinic, we have uh, an amazing group of providers that include geneticists and genetic counselors. So if there is a patient that has a family history of uh, pancreas, colon, breast melanoma, or you know, it's a pretty complex uh, process, but either way, we provide a uh, counseling and or a visit with the geneticist that can talk about the number of panels that can be tested and make recommendations based on your specific family history or personal history of cancer, which ones would be best to test for. And if any of those come back or depending on, we know we're missing something when it comes to the uh, genetic mutations. So even if there's a significant family history, but no genetic mutation found, sometimes that still puts you into a high risk hereditary population, in which case we would still follow you here in our prevention clinic. Um, and that would be with MRI or CT. And then that alternates with the EUS procedure that I talked about in the presentation. Um, so that you're, if you fall into that population, we would follow you here at the prevention clinic. All right, great, thank you. Uh, there was one other question about the ATM gene and I'll answer that, I think I can answer that quickly. Uh, it does play a role and there are, uh, you know, some percentage of pancreas cancers that have a mutation in the ATM gene. It's difficult though, um, because this gene can be mutated in your sort of, in someone's DNA that they have in all of their cells. And in, in that case, it's called germline. And those would be the ones that are potentially at risk for being inherited. Uh, but then the other issue is that these, that gene can be mutated in pancreas cancer uh, as part of the transition that uh, Emily showed from, uh, from sort of normal cells to pancreas cancer, even if it's not inherited. So um, it's important to know which one of those mutations it is. 
Uh, and the question about how often to get an MRI for pancreas cancer is surveillance. I think that goes back to the fact that these are decisions that are made sort of in the context of a, a coordinated effort for prevention. So I think it's, it's definitely important to be seen uh, in something like the, the prevention clinic to get a, re, you know, a, a definitive plan and make sure we're doing the right thing for people and not you know, over screening uh, in people who may not have any benefit from that screen. Um, next, there have been a few questions about COVID um, to sort of, and I, I mean, that's obvious, uh, something that we're all dealing with. So I, I think it, it's important to address that. One would be how COVID is influencing uh, care for patients and sort of delays to care uh, in patients, you know, in the era of COVID uh, and whether that's affecting people, what the timeline people can wait for treatment. Uh, the second uh, was uh, maybe for uh, Dr. Morris, but I think everyone can speak to this as well, how COVID is influencing research activities uh, for pancreas cancer. Sure. So uh, in terms of, we may start with the research part. Uh, on the preclinical side, uh, there, there was an early impact for sure uh, as um, we early on shut down uh, and we sort of reopened and are uh, at least performing essential research tasks. Things have slowed down a bit, but we're still making uh, considerable progress. Uh, we don't have uh, the, uh, as, as many undergraduates performing research as we have. Uh, and so there's uh, fewer folks participating. Uh, that's on the preclinical side. On the clinical side, uh, similar things slowed down a bit, um, but have continued and um, Probably others here could speak more to that. Uh, certainly on the clinical treatment side, uh, we continue to go ahead because uh, for many folks, this is something that cannot be delayed. I will say for um, the pancreas mass clinic and getting new patients in, um, we've made a really big effort into um, offering video visits for a lot of patients to at least initially get them into the clinic and get them seen providers and keeping everyone safe. So that really hasn't slowed down in terms of getting people into the clinic and getting kind of meeting your first initial visits and whether it be in-person or video visits. And for clinical research, I run a number of protocols, clinical research trials for patients with pancreas cancer. We did slow down in the spring as we learned how to function remotely. But our research program is ongoing. I have multiple patients on different trials and we just reopened a clinical trial for patients with pancreas cancer actually this week. And in regards to pancreas cancer prevention, we just opened in March, which was right before <laughs> all of this was getting, you know, uh, increased significantly. But a lot of our patients um, have to have imaging prior. So we've been kind of evaluating those patients on a case by case basis to figure out whether we can move their imaging out farther. Um, these are surveillance patients. Um, and then Patients for genetics, we've had a lot of new referrals for genetic patients that most of it can all be done um, in the comfort of their own home. They can meet with a genetics counselor via video. And a lot of the genetic testing panels are actually done with saliva. So they're getting sent to patients' homes. So um, I think we've all figured out how to adjust virtually as much as we possibly can in regards to patient care. Um, but it's been pretty incredible to see the things that we've been able to adjust so that we can still provide um, provide good care for patients too, so. I would add a, um, with regards to translational research. Um, so we do have uh, protocols that are up, including the University of Wisconsin's Precision Medicine Molecular Tumor Board Registry. Through COVID-19, we've, um, we've had uh, approval for, uh, for electronic signatures, um, you know, in, in review of uh, contributing tissue. Uh, to be used uh, under those protocols. And our, our research teams are here, um, you know, both for, for COVID-related research from some of our, our biobanks, um, but pancreas cancer research continues through efforts of our Precision Medicine Molecular Tumor Board um, as well. Um, and, and we do have opportunities for patients to participate in, in that, both from uh, access to next generation sequencing of, uh, of the tumors, but also um, in contributing uh, to the research that we're doing in, in deriving uh, individualized cultures for patients uh, from, from those cancers. 
Great, thank you. I think that's a, a great answer. Uh, there was sort of one question about what to do, uh, you know, if if um, treatment is delayed because of a COVID exposure or COVID positivity. And, and I would just say, you know, that's a very challenging situation. And I think we're all trying to do our best, trying to make sure that they need for their cancer, but also we certainly don't want to put them at risk uh, from something acute uh, if, if, you know, there's a chance that they might get COVID. So unfortunately, it, it's sometimes frustrating for patients, uh, but, you know, I think it's important to remember that, you know, getting, you know, if, if they were to get COVID on treatment, we are very worried about that. So um, we, we do take that very seriously and, and try to balance uh, that uh, as part of their treatment. Um, Next, I think I'd ask uh, maybe uh, Dr. Kratz, this is a, something I feel passionate about uh, even as a surgeon, uh, but maybe whole palliative care plays into patients with pancreatic cancer and, and how that factors into our uh, treatment plan for people. Yeah, that's great. So, um, you know, as a, as a senior fellow here at the Carbone Cancer Center, we're trained in hematology, oncology, and palliative care. And so palliative care certainly is a component of, of how we're trained and how we approach um, a serious cancer like pancreas cancer. Um, that being said, palliative care offers a layer of support for patients with advanced cancers. And that can range um, from, from family support to understanding you know, more about, um, about the, the components of, um, of symptoms that, that cancers can cause. In the, in the advanced phase. And so it really is a, a layer of support to help our patients um, that's focused on, on quality of life and measures that are directed at improving symptoms related, related to the cancer. As a medical oncologist, sometimes that can be helpful because uh, it provides us the opportunity to focus on things like what are the chemotherapy doses and how does that influence the toxicities that patients have or the side effects that patients have and the influence that that has on their quality of life. And it provides kind of an independent um, opportunity for a patient to review some of their symptoms or the, the goals related to the, their cancer-directed therapies and really have a sounding board that's independent of the relationship with their oncologist. So certainly our, our palliative care colleagues are, are fantastic. They are um, you know, a big part of, of treating um, advanced cancer, but I think the, the same is true of patients and their families. When we think about the influence of COVID-19, I think that having a, you know, an understanding of the people around a given cancer patient, I think that that's, that's, that's important as well. Um, but I think that palliative care is, is, is very integral to a disease like pancreas cancer where, um, you know, where, where we worry about um, not only the prognosis, but we, we also worry about the things that we ask our patients and the, the toxicities that they have from the therapies that they go through. Um, and so palliative care provides a window to have an open discussion about, about those, those types of, of um, you know, of features. Thanks, yeah, I, I think it's uh, important for everyone who's listening and uh, to know that, you know, we will often as providers talk about talking with the palliative and supportive care group and I think they get a bad rap because um, unfortunately, just uh, people think palliative care and it means we've, you know, they're being told that there's nothing, you know, more to do for them uh, medically and it's time, you know, they're, that, that's kind of it. And really that's not how we view it. Um, we view them as a group that helps patients make it through the, the therapies that we recommend. So um, if you hear, you know, a provider t talking to you about, you know, palliative and supportive care, uh, definitely something talk to about and just because you know you talk to them doesn't mean that you were sort of not doing anything else you know that's just uh, definitely something that becomes part of the care pathway that helps people make it through uh, whatever it is uh, the treatment uh, recommended to them. I will say too in the pancreas mass clinic um, as the navigator there I do place a number of referrals to palliative care at that initial contact so especially for the patients that are you know, having way more symptoms for their disease or patients that are presenting um, with stage four metastatic cancer, you know, getting them involved really early on in the process, I think is really important for those patients. Great. 
Um, I think uh, maybe I can ask uh, Dr. Morris, uh, when, did, um, maybe just in general, how do we, you know, determine in, in the part of a multidisciplinary plan, what are the general areas we decide to radiate uh, pancreas cancer? Sure. So, um, uh, and I think the question, that I want to make sure there's not confusion. My talk was uh, really focused on future directions and research approaches that I hope and, you know, potentially one day could become uh, realities in terms of how we use radiation. But that was a, a research talk. And uh, currently, we're, we're not doing that. That would be part of like a clinical trial. So I would start with the sort of standard indications, which would be uh, in some cases, we're using radiation in combination with other treatments like chemotherapy to help uh, treat a pancreatic cancer that has not spread and might be in the hopes of converting uh, someone with a borderline resectable tumor into uh, a more resectable tumor. In some cases, when it's not resectable, uh, it may be that uh, we do radiation alone and we've gotten uh, much better at being able to deliver very precise radiation. And we have some very unique uh, tools here at the University of Wisconsin to do that, and some clinical trials looking at uh, basically pushing the envelope in terms of how much radiation we can give, and uh, with some early data suggesting that when we give more radiation, which we now uh, have the ability to technically do, that we can achieve better outcomes. So those are some of the primary areas. In addition, uh, while sometimes uh, in the later stages of disease, patients may become too sick for uh, something like chemotherapy or surgery. Many times we can still deliver radiation in a palliative setting uh, and help with pain or things like that. And so that's another area uh, that radiation can play a role uh, for patients. In terms of the, the research side of things, uh, we do hope to open uh, some clinical trials in the pancreatic setting, as I mentioned. Um, uh, with immunotherapy and radiation together. And in that setting, we're using generally much lower doses of radiation than what we would be doing if we were trying to kill the tumor with radiation alone. Uh, we're simply trying to use that to stimulate an immune response. And it would um, generally be given uh, together with or slightly before in immunotherapy because we want the radiation to stimulate a response and the immunotherapy to uh, then uh, expand that response. Great, I think that's that's perfect. Um, there was uh, early on, and then as well, another follow up on this. Uh, if someone liked to, we, you know, we talked. To, uh, I think a lot of the talk focuses on pancreatic or the talks and everything that we've heard about talks about pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which is one of the more common things that we treat. But certainly, we do see a lot of patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, which is, uh, you know, though it's in the same organ, a, a very different uh, disease process. Um, and so if someone would be willing to comment on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and some of the, um, you know, main differences, uh, that we see with, with those. Hi, I, I can talk about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Most of the tumors that arise from the pancreas, the ones that we see most common on adenocarcinomas, this is a very aggressive subtype of cancer, as we talked earlier. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors uh, arise from a different type of cell that also lives in the pancreas. And these tumors have a very different behavior. And that's why we don't ever lump the two together. They behave very differently. Neuroendocrine tumors are typically classified based on how many cells are actively dividing. A lot of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that people talk about are the slow growing kind, the ones that have less than 20% of all the cells dividing. And these tumors tend to have very good prognosis. Um, can be taken out of a surgery, just like the other pancreas tumors if they haven't spread to other places. Uh, but we treat these tumors very, very differently. We don't use chemotherapy um, and, uh, and they, their behavior over time is quite different. So a completely different entity. There, there was a question in the uh, chat about, uh, I think some of the research topics and whether they might apply to um, the pancreatic neuroendocrine also. And I would just comment that uh, potentially they, they could. Uh, we, we don't have uh, data that they uh, would per se right now, uh, but uh, one of the features of immunotherapies is that they're not necessarily specific to one given type of cancer. Uh, and so the immunotherapies I discussed 
are approved and in the use for treatment of many different types of cancer. And uh, the approaches we would, that I talked about potentially could be applied to uh, neuroendocrine types uh, as well as the adenocarcinomas. But I would again emphasize that that's um, research and we have not proven that yet. So it's not something that's kind of currently available. We're hoping to see if that could work though. Great, and I would say just uh, just to uh, highlight some, you know, that is a surgery, you know, surgically as we treat these, some are um, slow growing enough that if they're very small and on biopsy are very slow growing, um, there are some that actually we, depending on the patient's specific circumstances, um, we actually feel comfortable uh, watching them over time to make, you know, to get an idea of how fast they're growing. So if you're someone that is diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor and, you, you know, the, the option is sometimes to sort of observe to see how fast they grow. That is sometimes how we uh, treat um, people with very small and uh, slow growing neuroendocrine tumors. Um, next, uh, maybe uh, Emily and Crystal, this I think was in your talk. Uh, there's uh, questions about uh, potential causes, etiology of pancreatic cancer uh, and that there seems to be you know, pancreatic cancer is on the rise and what's, um, you know, maybe why we think that is, uh, if you guys. Yeah, so I can talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> um, so the first slide was actually cut off and it had some of that information. So it's one of the great challenges of switching everything to uh, recorded, but um, it is increasing. And I guess the the good news is, is that we're seeing an increase in survival. So, um, Back in 2011, it was uh, the five-year survival rate was about five or six percent, and we're seeing it now at around 10 percent, um, which is an amazing increase. But it's still only 10 percent, so we know we have a lot of work to do yet. Um, as far as risk factors, we talked about the big ones. Um, some other ones that I know some people are doing research on now is, and you guys have probably all heard about the importance of sleep, but interrupted circadian rhythms um, have uh, had an increased risk for pancreas cancer. And some of these things that are still in research, you know, we can't tell you exactly what the significance of it is now because it's just too early. Um, but sleep is definitely something being researched stress. Um, let's see, anything else I'm missing, Crystal, that they're looking at for risk or no, I think um, the big ones in, that Emily mentioned too in the slides were, you know, smoking is such a huge um, risk factor along, you know, with um, alcohol and diet. So keeping those in mind and um, being on the lookout, you know, a big key thing that I think we miss um, a lot out in the community is um, patients that are either their diabetes is worsening or they are a new diabetic for kind of unknown reasons um, is kind of a, a warning kind of sign kind of to keep an eye out for that as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And in our prevention clinic too, we also evaluate all those risk factors and try to link patients with smoking cessation programs, um, nutrition, um, things that we can implement now for these patients that don't have pancreas cancer, but we know that they have an increased risk. That's the whole goal of our clinic during these populations of people that have this increased risk so that we can try to do something now to try to prevent it. So we have a lot more work to do, but we also are, um, you know, we, we're trying to work on a lot of different angles with the clinic too. Great. Uh, thank you both. Um, so I, I would ask, uh, there's more research questions. So I, one thing about, uh, one question about tumor metabolism uh, and, the, and another about uh, whether or not there are groups within the university in Carbone that are partnering with local uh, biotech companies. Um, I'm relatively new to the university, so I, I leave that up to uh, maybe those who have been here uh, longer and more engaged to give an idea of maybe what some of those things, what some of those partnerships are and, and. Yeah, for sure. Um, so here in, um, in the McArdle Research Laboratories, we look uh, specifically at the metabolism of pancreas cancer cultures um, derived from patients, um, both at baseline 
and with um, an under kind of the, the selection of chemotherapy um, in our models. And what we find is, is that kind of the diversity of metabolism and the ability to kind of expand various metabolic states, that that plays a, a particular role in the resistance and that cultures that have kind of more, uh, more elaborate uh, expanses and can have different forms in, in our cultures, those are the ones that are, are most resistant to the therapies that we, that we see. Um, at a national level, there's a, a phase three trial called Avenger, um, which is completed or cruel. That's looking specifically at, at targeting metabolism. Um, and our hope is, is that we'll have a, a read of that trial uh, here within the next year or so um, to, to consider kind of, you know, is inhibiting uh, pathways of metabolism. How does that play in uh, to our therapeutic strategies, but we're waiting on kind of the maturation of, of those treatment types. Um, I, would, I would add, there was a question in the chat about Agent Orange exposure in pancreas cancer. Um, here at UW, uh, we, we do have a partnership uh, with the Veterans Administration. Um, and um, out of that, um, we, we have a protocol that actually um, is looking nationally at whether or not there's specific gene alterations or mutations in cancers and how that links back to Agent Orange. And so that actually is, is research um, that we have IRB approval for and we're, we're working through those data sets uh, at this time. But currently um, there's no clear link between Agent Orange exposure and pancreas cancer research, like what we see in other cancers, specifically um, in, in cancers like lung cancer, um, that, that is one that that link has been, been uh, proven and, and there's uh, enough evidence base to say that that's more likely than not for, for our veterans who, um, who served in, in Vietnam. But currently we don't have uh, that enough information, but that is active research actually that, um, that we're doing here at, at UW through kind of national registries um, of, of uh, VA uh, data sets. Specific to the question about biotech interactions, there, there are uh, many and broad interactions between um, many researchers here on campus as well as clinicians uh, between uh, both Madison-based biotech uh, and pharmaceutical companies and, and worldwide biotech and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so absolutely is the answer to that question, yes. Uh, we interact uh, frequently with those folks often uh, collaborating with them to uh, advance uh, on the current state of our detection and, and therapeutic uh, devices and, and treatments. Great, that's perfect. Um, there was another question in chat that's maybe surgical in nature and I'm happy to, to answer it. Um, which is one of the main arteries in the belly that supplies the intestines and stomach and whether, you know, that can be surgically resected. I, I certainly would uh, not, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't think we want to dive into providing any specific uh, advice uh, about surgery uh, or treatment. And certainly we want everyone to, you know, come in and see our providers here. And so we can get a very good idea of specific cases uh, and give, you know, uh, appropriate information. I will say in general, though, um, it hits on a point that is important to know about pancreatic cancer treatment. Uh, surgery certainly is something that we hope uh, to offer, you know, everyone uh, potentially uh, as a as part of their treatment pathway. Um, one of the main things that sort of uh, decide, you know, determines whether or not that's possible for people uh, is about how those tumors. Um, interact and sort of are they're positioned around some of the main blood vessels, arteries and veins in the, in the belly. Um, what we know is that for some people, we can do surgeries that, you know, resect or sort of take out and reconstruct some of those blood vessels. Um, but in, in very specific cases and after patients have usually gotten chemotherapy first, potentially radiation, uh, because what we found is that if we do very big surgeries to take out and reconstruct all of these blood vessels, um, it, it very much is sort of a, a marker that, you know, we can't control it just with surgery and it becomes a very big surgery to recover from. So we only do that in cases where we think that it's going to mean a meaningful survival from their cancer to sort of justify such a big surgery. Um, 
So we've certainly gotten better at this uh, over time, uh, doing bigger surgeries that may involve reconstructing or taking out some of these blood vessels. Uh, and the reason we can do that is because we've gotten better with chemotherapy and radiation to kind of shrink the tumors or control uh, some of the other cancer cells in the area. So, um, you know, that's, that's how I would answer that question that it's hard to say specifically, but in the right setting, um, we can surgically address um, many of these tumors, uh, even if they're nearby some of those uh, blood vessels. Um, and then one last question. Uh, there was another question that popped up about the COVID. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I do see that the question was asking about what, you know, what that means for treatment. Uh, again, I think it's hard to answer specifically for, you know, in any given situation. And I think it's important that, you know, people talk to their providers and sort of balance what the risks and benefits, um, you know, I, I would say in the scheme of, of cancer therapy, uh, you know, we aim to start people on therapy or, you know, do surgery when it's necessary within um, a few weeks. So um, it, it's always hard to say for sure, but generally a delay of a week or two, especially if it means a patient um, is going to be in better shape to start that therapy is certainly, certainly wise. There are things like um, radiation therapy, for instance, where it, once you start it, you really need to finish. And, and we do have protocols in place here to treat patients who are co even COVID positive. So um, I think many of us are learning how to cope with this, but uh, uh, we do have protocols in place to safely do that if we need to. All right, great. So unless any of the other, um, I think we've gotten through all of the questions, um, unless any of the other panelists have any, uh, you know, final thoughts, things that are came up and are important to mention, uh, give them an opportunity here to do that. I would just add briefly um, that COVID certainly has impacts about the, the medical treatments, um, whether, you know, that's surgery or radiation or chemotherapy, um, but it also has social implications in, in patients. Um, and I would just add that, um, you know, it's so important uh, for all the members on this call that, um, you know, just like the pandemic that we're going through, that, um, that we stay connected. As doctor teams, we work together through our, our multidisciplinary tumor boards. Uh, the same is true of patients and their families um, with a serious diagnosis like pancreas cancer. And so making sure that, that families, you know, remain connected um, despite maybe the physical barriers uh, of, of patients on treatment. I think that that's really important um, in the support of a family through a, a serious diagnosis of pancreas cancer is a big part of, of what we do. Um, and so I, I, I just would emphasize that um, particularly um, during, during this season. All right, great. Um, so I think we'll uh, wrap up here. Um, I'd like to thank the organizer of this event, uh, Dr. Sophia Refatoff, uh, and hosts uh, Mary Nutt and Carrie Miller. Um, to our presenters and our task force volunteers, our patients and our caregivers, uh, and again, uh, excellent panelists for this evening. Um, but I think most of all, everyone involved in the call are sort of planning this, uh, sort of the only reason we do it is for you, know, you the community participants who, who have taken the time to call in uh, and join us tonight. Um, we're grateful that you could be with us today. Um, you'll receive a link via email to a recording of this presentation. Um, I think we tell patients that, you know, hearing things more than once is helpful. So I'd encourage everyone to sort of, if you thought you heard something and, and want to hear it again, uh, do that. Um, so we at the Carbone wish you a good and safe uh, Thanksgiving holiday as well as a holiday season to everyone. Uh, stay safe. So thank you. Yeah.